Hello and welcome to Birth Time, the podcast. Following the success of our world-renowned and international award-winning film, Birth Time, the documentary, we are coming back together to explore a wide variety of topics around pregnancy, birth and postpartum. As a way of exploring topics in great depth, we will be covering one topic over several episodes, bringing you up-to-date evidence-based information from academics, practitioners and birth workers, as well as stories and lived experiences from birthing women and people and their families. We will also have interludes with people we interviewed in Birth Time the Documentary, finding out where life has taken them since the creation of the film. Join your hosts, home birth midwife Jo Hunter and doula and birth photographer Jerusha Sutton as we delve deep into the world of growing and birthing babies. Hello, hello, and welcome back to Birth Time, the podcast. This is our fourth episode in our first series, the Birth Trauma Series, and today we are very lucky to have the incredible Fiona Reed joining us. Fiona has practiced midwifery for over 30 years. She's worked in rural, regional, and metropolitan centres. She has worked in several midwifery roles, including private midwifery practice, birth centres, MGP, and overseas in Papua New Guinea and India. She has worked as a midwifery clinical specialist in a level six maternity hospital and as a clinical midwifery consultant in a level five maternity hospital. And she has developed and taught midwifery studies in two universities and a TAFE. In 2018, Fiona initiated and developed a formal birth debriefing service using trauma-informed care principles at a regional hospital. And in that capacity, she has debriefed 567 women, families, and practicing midwives. She now understands the urgent need for deep, compassion-driven care in maternity services for everyone involved in receiving care and for those providing care if we want to modify trauma by protecting the humanness of expert clinical practice. Fiona, it's so great to have you here on our podcast. Now, can you maybe just start in telling us a little bit about your journey to how you got to where you are? Oh, we're going back a long way. Yeah. Why not? Uh, <laughs> so I've been in a midwife for 36 years. Um, and during that time, I've worked, um, you know, in every role, really, Um I've worked locally, rurally, internationally. I've worked in education in three universities. I've worked independently for 12 years. Um, and I've worked in a birth centre and also in large tertiary maternity units and uh, regionally. And... Um, and I've worked on an MGP as well. So kind of a mishmash uh, all over the place. And then um, I landed at a regional hospital and I had been working in MGP and I moved into the position of um, clinical midwife consultant. And it became really clear in that role um, and I was moving around the units very much, it became clear that there were women who wanted to access someone to talk to about how to change what had happened in during their labour and birth in a previous birth. And they wanted to talk to someone about how they go about changing uh, what had happened so that that combination of things never happened again. So women who had felt very anxious about re-entering the system and wanted some control over or just wanted to know, sometimes they just wanted to know how to decline management or advice. And other women wanted to change the whole thing so that they were never that vulnerable again. And so I started sort of providing, so the antenatal midwives started saying, oh, I think this woman wants to talk to you. And it started off as small as that, like five women. 
And within a year, within a few months, the postnatal midwives were starting to tap me on the shoulder and say, look, this woman's had a very, uh, a very difficult experience. And I think it might be helpful if she talked to you. And we went from that to five years later, having set up a formal debriefing clinic, because what became clear was that women were trying to re-enter the system from a very low base of control, empowerment, and any sense of um, bodily autonomy. And they wanted to change aspects of what had happened or they wanted to avoid what had happened and they'd never been debriefed or they had been told they were debriefed but they couldn't remember it or they didn't think, feel that 30 seconds constituted a debrief. So five years down the track, um, I had set up a formal debriefing clinic and I had uh, worked with 563 women um, to do debriefing. And we, I had also written a business plan to, to, to suggest to the hospital that they do, do something about this. It, this was an obvious um, area of neglect. And um, I felt that it was, it really warranted proper, um, a proper, a properly established clinic with dedicated staff, midwives, who were well trained and had experience and um, and to run a, a formal debriefing clinic two two days a week. Um, so how, how did how did women access it? How did they know that it existed? Oh yes. Um, so first of all, it was the midwives themselves referring women. Then it was the medical staff referring women. Then it was um, GPs, word of mouth um, initially, um, and then GPs, then psychologists in the area, um, and then we and then women just started ringing and referring, self-referring. And was it funded, Fiona? Was it? Did women pay for it, or was it a no, free service? No, it was a free service part of public health care, Great. but um, it, it started to sort of play a very significant part of my time management mm -hmm. <laughs> because, you know, managing, taking, so women, uh, so women would be referred to me either by email and, uh, or a more formal process um, and women would ring. I would have a list of phone numbers and names at the end of any day and then phone to um, to check what they wanted and then make an appointment. So I was running an appointment diary and and then um, and then conducting the appointments. Yeah. And so when it became a clinic and there were other midwives that were also providing that service. No, no other midwives. Oh, no other did. It was just you that was doing just it. Just me. Yeah. Okay, right, far out. Okay, that's a lot. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, on top of your job as a clinical midwifery consultant. Yeah, it was a and, lot. Yeah, and so it ran for two days a week? No, that was my suggestion. Oh, okay. I when see. I realised this was very, this is serious and it was a real gap in service and it was in, and then I started to do my own sort of, I my own sort of research into it. So I had um, done trauma-informed care through Melbourne University and that was very pivotal in my development as um, a midwife able to have difficult conversations really. And that, that training made me aware of a way of looking at trauma. And so then I did... I did some personal study around um, neurobiology and brain science. And so then I sort of developed a, a way of managing an appointment and a way of helping women to understand what had happened at the time um, that they were experiencing an unanticipated or, or a traumatic or a complete disastrous event around the time of labour and birth. And 
it it just went like wildfire, really. Women were so this area of their lives and their experience within maternity service was so under acknowledged and unrecognized that once we started providing a place for them to come and to talk with someone and then to i was in the fortunate position and the hospital supported me to do this so you know that they, they were very encouraging of okay you've identified this need women are, are coming you you just do it and uh and they they trusted me with it which was kind of nice but um but the need exceeded my capacity to fulfill it uh so women would um would call and and they were either uh, the postnatal midwives would put me in contact with women in the you know, the days after the birth, and I would just drop by and introduce myself and leave them with a contact number. And then at some point when they were ready, they would call and or they would be, women would be referred any time from the time they gave birth, usually to within a year of giving birth, a year postnatally, and and then other women would come through the antenatal clinic presenting for care for a subsequent baby and they would say something to a midwife um, and the midwife would then offer them a debriefing um, appointment and, and a lot of women took up that, that offer at that time. So it may, it may have been two years after the birth, four years, five years, six years after they had their last baby they'd never been debriefed, they'd never had any sort of, a bit, a, a, never had a formal way of processing what had happened, to having any questions answered and um, and to have an explanation for why what happened had happened and an opportunity then to make, have a discussion about how to change things and what what, how to put in place some strategies and precautions so that they didn't have to worry about having the same experience or a similar experience. And in terms of the feedback from that from that service, I mean, was it was there an opportunity for the women to give feedback on how that was for them? Did yes. they? Did, did, and, it, and what what came of that? It was never formalized. It was I was so busy in those years. Mm, mm. <laughs> um, I needed, uh, and I, I did actually poke around for a research assistant because I realised early that this this was going to be a thing um, and it probably needed some formal structure around it, but I just couldn't, I, I didn't have the ability to, we couldn't employ one and um, had it, a couple of the universities um, approach me, but there were ethics problems, um, so it didn't ever eventuate. So the the, the uh, feedback was never formal. It was only informal and it was collected by myself. Yeah. And, yeah, significant, significant, made, it made a significant difference in women's lives and how they felt about approaching another labour and birth and postnatal period. Yeah. Yeah, yeah of course. So what do you consider or what is considered generally to, what's the definition of birth trauma? It's fascinating because this is quite a dynamic um, phase now and the research around uh, birth trauma and women's experience of birth trauma, there's very little and it's because there is no one recognised model because there's not enough research around it, everybody's doing a something different and there are American models, English models, there are European models, but there is no one thing that debriefing means, but we are all approaching the same issue, which is exactly what you say, a definition of birth trauma, but really it lies with the woman. I don't believe any external sort of diagnostic formula can actually address what birth trauma is, except that it is both physical and psychological. And it's also, there's an overlay there with birth injury. So 
as, as you know, a significant number of women experience birth injury at the time of birth that is both physical and psychological. It's kind of a better term, I think, socially than birth trauma because trauma has been so um, reduced or diminished in its power. But when you when you identify a woman as having a birth injury, it actually carries a kind of a more, um, I don't know, something about calling it an injury. And indeed, you know, there is very serious injury. 40% of forceps deliveries result in avulsion of the levodorena. This absolutely changes a woman's life forever. The um, surgery to repair that is not... Um, it's not it's mostly unsuccessful there are some things that can be done but when women think about they went they went in with the dream of a baby and a birth and they come out and they can't run distance anymore they can't engage in physical exercise anymore they can't control their bladder or their bowels this is not has not been well recognised. And partly that's because once women are discharged from care, which can be two weeks after birth, any ongoing gynaecological issue is gynaecology. It's not related to the birth. And so having there's no data out there to collect because it's been renamed now. It's not... It's not postnatal birth injury. It's now gynecology. And so it shows up in gyne stats, not in birth stats. And this is something that actually needs to be addressed as well, is how do the information systems capture how many women are actually having <laughs> treatment and management for birth, physical birth injury and psychological birth injury, harm, trauma, in the years after a baby is born. Hey there, Zoe Naylor here from the Birth Time team. Do you have an audience who would be interested in watching Birth Time the documentary? It doesn't matter if you have one follower or 100,000 followers across your social media or database. You can become a Birth Time Cicada affiliate. When you share the film, you'll receive 30% commission and the people you forward it to will also enjoy a 20% discount to watch the film. On our own, it can be difficult to be heard, but together, we can be deafening. Let's rise together. You can find out all the info via our website at birthtime.world. Now, it's back to the podcast. Fiona, for those who may not know, can you just explain what that condition is that you mentioned? The abortion of the levodorenae. So the mm. levodorenae is um, part of the um, pelvic floor and that attaches in the front of the pelvis. You have the front pelvic bones that have a separation at the front, which is called the symphysis pubis. Mm -hmm. Those two arms wrap around to the back of the pelvis and join to the um, sacrum and the lower bones of the pelvis. Now, the pelvic floor runs between the sacrum at the back, the lower back, and forward like a trampoline sling and attaches inside the front of the front bones of the pelvis and into that pelvic floor. It holds all the abdominal organs up, including the uterus, and there are three holes through the pelvic floor where urine comes out, uh, the vagina is there and also the anus, the rectum is there. So during a forceps birth, with the need for a degree of power and force to draw the baby out, either with the mother pushing or not pushing, the force of the the akusha, the person who is conducting the birth, and in, in Australia that's always a medical doctor, the force to pull the baby out is against the attachment of the, pel of the um, pelvic floor at the front of the pelvis. And so in 40% of forceps, that pelvic floor is torn from the 
attachment of the bones. Now, it can be torn from one side, which leaves the pelvic floor unbalanced and unattached on one side, or it can be torn from both sides, which leaves the pelvic floor detached from its main support. So you have the ureter you have the urethra, the vagina and the rectum not properly supported or held against into the abdomen, into the lower abdomen, into the pelvis. And so you can imagine the abdominal organs then can slump. And so you have things like significant prolapse and incontinence and um and an inability for the vagina to function normally. Yeah. So and so that's that stat was forty percent of forceps yes. births that injury. It's incredible. Occurs. Yes. And and so this is this is significant because and we are much more aware now in terms of consent and informed consent, shared decision making. We've made a lot of headway uh, with training clinicians how to do that better but we still don't do it very well. When there's the added pressure of perhaps a baby in distress or um, a mother in distress at the time a baby needs to be born, if the forceps is needed to be done quickly um, or there's a sense that um, it needs to be done quickly, there, there's... Often, you know, how do you prepare a woman to make a decision about a forceps or is, in fact, a Caesar often to prevent levator avulsion, levator ani avulsion? These are, you know, these are difficult things that we're balancing here. Um, but the outcome is that women who have this um, following, um, following a forceps delivery, and it can happen at, with a normal delivery, but very low incidence. It can happen with a von twos, but a lower incidence than forceps. Um, but do women know that this is potentially an outcome that will, you know, once they're discharged from, from the hospital service, uh, the hospital doesn't hear about it and doesn't have to hear about it again. But women then have to lead their lives of working out how they're going to live with a detached levator anine and has a huge impact, as you can imagine, has a huge impact on mm -hmm. their lives. And we've got women out there in the community. This has just not been well recognised and there is no um, complete remedy for this. Uh, so the story starts way back. Um, it starts back with preparation for birth. It's, it's enduring the labour if we... And this is just one aspect of birth injury. You know, there are mm. so many birth injuries that can occur. The implication is, you know, well, what do we do? Do we seize all women? Well, no, that carries other complications and problems. How do we, do we have to look at the management of forceps deliveries? Probably, probably. Do we have to find new methods and ways of doing it? Do you have a structure where um, only experienced clinicians can do forceps perhaps. These are all things that probably will need to be considered now that we have taken the lid off the degree of um, injury and trauma associated with particular types of births. And but surely there's a number of women out in the community living with these injuries and possibly not even knowing it. Absolutely. Right? If, they're not, if they're not hooked into services who help them diagnose that. Mm, yes, that's completely correct. And the other thing is the nature of women and the narrative that exists that you will be changed and your body will be changed by birth and you just suck it up, sister. Yeah. Um, that's part of it. So there, there's a significant, um, there are, there's a significant number of women who are living with and managing physical injury and psycholog psychological injury, um, and they are functioning, and this is the thing about women, they will function even if, if they are functioning in a less than optimal way or they're living with chronic pain, chronic leakage uh, and chronic inability to walk for longer than 20 minutes to ever 
play netball or hockey or sail or football again, that, you know, they're giving up physical activities that give them pleasure, joy and keep them fit because they can't do that anymore and they're going to tolerate it. A certain number of women will tolerate it thinking that there is no, that it's just what happens. And and women, just as women will tolerate and continue to function when they're not attached to their infant. They've never, they don't have a secure attachment. They haven't developed it and it hasn't arrived. And the infant is several months old, up, up to a year, and they're not attached to the infant. But you look at them and they are functioning in a maternal role, but they don't feel, uh, they're not sure that they actually love their baby that they're caring for. Mm. It's another aspect of psychological injury that women are carrying. Hence the suicide rate. Yeah, that's one of the things that I was keen to touch on too, because a lot of um, a lot of there's a lot of belief out there that birth trauma or birth injury is, is physical, and then as a result, emotional or yes. psychological. However, yes. we we also know that there can be birth trauma, emotional, psychological, without physical injury. Exactly. Um, exactly. Which is, yeah, which is what we we heard from in a couple of the women that we interviewed for birth time, was that yeah. you know if you looked at their birth on a piece yeah. of paper, it was a normal physiological yeah. birth that looked like it went very very well. Straight and yet forward. They've, yeah, yeah, and yet they've still come out feeling mm. disempowered and mm. coerced and not listened to and all the things that we know. So mm. I thought maybe we can just touch on that side of it a little bit, Fiona, mm. because that's also really important um, and I th- a side of it that people don't actually realise is possible. It's really interesting because um, one of the things I heard very frequently um, from women was that everything looked, sounded, was managed fine, but then they were separated from their infant. And I I completely understood after a while that separating mothers from their babies is one of the worst things we can do to a woman and infant dyad. It completely interrupts it. And I think that's hard for people to understand the depth of despair, and it must be ethnographic, you know, it must be something that is deeply embedded in the female psyche, that you have to be able to see the infant and you have to be able to reach the infant at all times in order to prevent harm and to save its life, to pick it up and move it if if there's a sense of threat. But what happens within the system, as we know, is that there is a sense of threat, terrible sense of threat and harm, but the woman either has been separated from her baby for hours through need, um, Caesar, baby is taken to nursery perhaps or taken back to the ward and um, and we are very careful to put babies with the other parent but in actual fact, unless the woman is unconscious, and even then I would suggest all women should have their baby placed on them, even if they are in ICU and intubated, babies mm-hmm. should be taken to the mother at regular intervals and placed skin to skin. But for women who go from theatre or to recovery, there should be no separation of the baby. Women have to be able to see and be able to reach, touch, feel their baby at all times. We would reduce so much <laughs> terrible harm if we just put that into place. Mm. Women in the um, in the birth space who then perhaps they have a, a significant bleed or they have a retained placenta and they need to go to theatre, um, even then, um, you know, small innovations such as um, making sure that she has her phone and, and, and while she's conscious, she can see the, her baby. So even though she can't touch and feel, she can observe the baby. And all they, all they want to do is be able to see that the baby is all right, preventing other people from holding a baby. So many women reported that they couldn't let go of the feeling of um it was actually threat manifesting as real anger, um, but what they were afraid of was someone else holding their baby and, and mothers-in-law and mothers 
um, and aunties having the first hold of their infant. Like it's a, it's it's terrible. It does terrible things to women's psyche and their and their all their maternal instincts. I've so, had I've had women with their babies handed back to them, smelling of their mother in law's perfume, yeah. and yeah. it's just horrendous for them. It is. And do you know when when you say this? And I was um, writing birth plans with women um, so that the staff could be aware of what the issues were, what what I want, what I don't want, what I will not accept. Just three things, one piece of paper, very simple, dot points, very easy to grasp for stuff. But what women felt so strongly about was I do not want anyone else to hold my baby um, until I have held it. So simple, and yet it's very difficult to get that dignified. I'm not sure why in a female-dominated wow. profession. I'm not sure why. But that um, having that heard, and this is, a, this is a, a female story, I think, is to be heard and seen and then to be validated about what you are saying is just a, a chronic uh, problem with women communicating about their, their lives. But... It was a it's a very serious um, lack um, mm -hmm. in the system. Fiona, you mentioned earlier about uh, you doing training in trauma informed care. Yeah, how do you feel our clinicians are trained in that now? In their standard run of you know midwifery or obstetrics training, how much trauma informed care education is there? No, none. There's none. How is that? I think I, I really think it's part of um, we have become so medically focused and medical focus is physical and to have an appreciation of the the equal damage that things that we do or don't do the equal psychological damage that those things cause and have the causes identified and have a remedy for those things is all linked to caring with, um, you know, not compassion but deep compassion and mm -hmm. hearing what women want. We've got a very poor, in regional areas, I think it's perhaps a little better in urban areas, but how many times in maternity units have you seen consumers welcomed in as part of meetings, as part of M&Ms. We should have consumer representation on all of those things where there is a consumer voice that feeds back to us about the impact of these things. And we don't. It's a closed shop. We keep it under wraps to protect and we keep it under wraps because we, we, we want to own the information, but we also want to control what happens with the information. When you open it up to consumers, you open it up to uninformed opinion. But in actual fact, you're going to improve the service because we are so institutionalised that we don't, can't hear, can't see the damage. And we don't want to know about that because we, we feel good about our work and we need to because look at the mess it's in. So um, the M and M meetings, just to it's a morbidity and mortality meeting, um, and that that's okay. That, that that happens within the institution uh, where yeah. there's been poorer outcomes, doesn't it? And they and they're yeah. sort of reflecting on cases of yes. things that have happened, and yeah. So that's what you're saying that consumers should be involved in those yes. as well as clinicians. Yeah, yes. and they're in line with the patriarchal structure that it all that's right. operates within. That's exactly right, and in order. I don't, I don't, find, I mean, hospitals, I've heard a lot of hospitals say that they value innovation, but I, I, I really don't see it. Real innovation would be to open the doors and flatten the hierarchy a little bit so that consumers could actually speak to us about what is meaningful in care and what is uh, dangerous to the consumer, to the individuals coming in. And we don't, we're so used to telling, not listening, mm. and to basing it on scientific evidence instead of 
asking people how did that feel. Like we are so physically focused and trauma-informed care changes that to making the clinician or the um, uh, the professional aware of the psychological life that lies within the physical life, that they're always hand in hand. And it just emphasises that in a very clear way with a, a very good structure to sort of examine it. Mm. It should be across the board as part of every uni degree for anybody that's working with birthing women. I agree. And yeah. I think hospitals also have a responsibility. Uh, you know, the health budget is, is always under pressure. But I really feel that clinicians um, should be provided with ongoing training in mm -hmm. trauma-informed care. And I would even go so far as to suggest that um, hospitals should be employing uh, a, a trauma-informed care practitioner um, so hospitals who are providing maternity services where X number of births plus are done should have a trauma-informed care professional who comes in um, for a, a day a week, a couple of days a month, something like that, but who should be working with um, all the clinicians regularly. Yes, I love that. Yeah. How amazing would that be? Extremely and I think amazing. in that way too you would get proper debriefing for staff mm. Um provided and we know we have we have all worked with staff who are so traumatized mm -hmm. from repeated exposure that they they're very difficult to work with um and you know if if you're working with a colleague who's difficult or is um living in a, a sympathetic nervous system accelerated way all the time Imagine how consumers feel when they come in. They're not even used to them. <laughs> yeah. They are receiving care from people who are, have unrecognised, unmanaged trauma, and they're living it out in the place that they have uh, become traumatised in. Yeah. And which, then inform, which then informs their clinical decision-making. Exactly. Um, which is not always appropriate for individuals. Yes. It's a lot. It's a lot. Yeah, I know it's a it big check. <laughs> I know. One of the ways that you can support the birth time movement is to invest in some birth time merchandise. Getting the merch out there helps build brand awareness and encourages people to watch the film. It also kickstarts much needed conversations within our communities. We have a bag, a book, keep cup, and organic and sustainably sourced hoodies and t-shirts. Head to birthtime.world to find out more. I listened to your presentation at the birth trauma uh, hearing inquiry and it was just the way that you spoke so beautifully and just so uh, with such intelligence and grace and empathy. I, I, this is really why I wanted to get you on because it, it's all of that stuff does need to be heard by everybody, not just birthy geeks that like to listen to hearing parliamentary hear hearings, you know. So that's one of the reasons. So whilst we're here, because we, I know that we're all running out of a bit of time here, but it will be great to have talk a little bit about that, about your experience. And Well, obviously you put in a submission, did you, for um, the parliamentary yes. inquiry, and then they contacted you and asked you, you to do a presentation. Yes. And that's how you became part of the hearing. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Uh, and so how was that process? Like what and what do you feel? Um, do you feel positive about what might come out of this inquiry? How how are you? I hope so. I, I thought um I thought it was fantastic. Um I I I believe that the the, the people on in the inquiry that itself uh were quite traumatized by. <laughs> by what they heard and who they heard it from and how um, it was communicated to them. I think that they were probably very shocked um, because it, it, it is very confronting to hear that a health, health, our health services are creating harm and that we don't know about it. And yet, and, and that is, confronting and it's I know it was very confronting for clinicians um but 
unless we honestly look at it and we remain curious and we ask the right question, we ask the people who it's happened to, can you please tell us, you know, what it's like, what has happened so we can understand nothing will change. And the women who spoke were so courageous. Mm. Um, I I just felt compelled as a clinician. I I had to support them and um and talk about what i what what i knew from experience um i can't remember what you asked oh you're answering it beautifully <laughs> oh, okay <laughs> the the inquiry itself was very intimidating but they were they were so well organized like the phone calls and the setting up and the checking and the um someone there on arrival they were so it was so well done that um it was okay but um I would have liked to then, I would have liked to have had a second go at the end of that day of just raising things that then came up after I did my presentation. I would have liked to address some of those things. And actually, I felt a little bit frustrated that um, there was one comment about debriefing, hot and cold debriefing. What does that I, mean? Well, hot debriefing is where um, uh, there was. It was a comment about staff being provided with hot and cold debriefing, and hot debriefing is where there is a quick debrief check in, very close to the um, event, mm -hmm. and then cold debriefing is maybe days, forty eight hours, even um, a week later, two weeks later where okay. it's, it's more sort of there's longer time given to it. So the hot hot one is just to check that everybody's okay. Is there anything that we need to address immediately? Um, mm -hmm. And then the cold one is um, a more thorough sort of look at it. And, um, and that just isn't being done. And, um, and I think the inquiry goes when they heard that that, that was being provided, you can literally see the, the physical response was, oh, thank goodness. You know, everybody sat back in their chair a little bit and their mm. shoulders came down. Well, that's not, that's not right. It's not being mm. done. So, and we continue, and even the effect that for clinicians hearing that they are complicit in or they are party to or they are, they've been present during significant trauma and injury, how do you then expect clinicians to deal with that? What was put in place for the clinicians back in the hospitals who were hearing about the, their place of work and their work? How were they supported to hear the stories and, um, and colleagues talking about birth trauma during the birth trauma inquiry? Like, these things have to be done so carefully so people are not only re-traumatised, but the trauma is not continued and then... Um, you know, uh, uh, increased by a feeling of remorse or self-blame or blame of others. These are all aspects of trauma. We're just not doing it well enough. We're not doing it compassionately enough. We're not doing it thoroughly enough. Mm. I didn't talk about consumer representation, but it is something, another aspect of this, that I think we have to crack open the very tightly held control around information and flow of information and what happens during an incident and even properly identifying incidents when they occur. So there is, I think, a need for women, and this is a terrible suggestion because as if the antenatal period isn't overloaded already, but... I do think that women entering the system, they need to have some way of communicating to the system when they come in for booking, what their degree, what degree of trauma or injury they have been carrying since their last birth. And there are some very good um, formats that are available um, where women could be sent a questionnaire before they come in for the booking and has to be just very neat. But if they were given a score um, when that information was received, and, of course, you wouldn't get it back from all women, but any woman who identified as having trauma 
um, she should be put into a, a, um, a specific care model, I believe, so that she is cared for in a in a in a way that is trauma informed care all the way through and for a longer period a longer period of time postnatally. Okay, so if you were sitting up there in Parliament House, writing, <laughs> looking through all the submissions and writing what you would like to see happen. Yes. What, obviously what you've said about trauma-informed care and all of the uh, clinicians, you know, having a good understanding of that and learning that as part of their degrees. But what else would it look like? It's yes. your choice. What would you do? Yeah, I would immediately put in formal debriefing clinics into every institution. Mm. <laughs> and, um, yeah, and the trauma-informed care um, profession, professional, um, I would have that established um into all maternity units. And I would also create a stream or a model of care within the institution where women who I self-identified as carrying injury, either physical or psychological, would be seen by a very specifically well-trained cohort of midwives and clinician and um, medical staff. And what about from the perspective of let's let's look at women who are having their first babies <clears throat> who aren't mm. coming in with birth trauma. Well, we know um, the answer to that. Well, they either birth at home or um, they go through MGP. Uh, why is not MGP the dominant model of care? All risk, no exit. Why absolutely. have we still not implemented that? Why is that, Fiona? Why is that? <laughs> <laughs> that's a whole well, that's podcast. podcast. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay, well, we're, we're going to end off by asking everybody that comes on, and I think you've kind of answered it, but anyway, let's let's. I'll ask it in a different way. Um, the same question as what we asked everybody in the documentary, which was what do you feel like it would take for all women to emerge from their births physically well and emotionally safe? Yeah, it's a very layered question. I think we are doing one of the greatest harms we've done to women in birth is to um, create an environment that speaks of greater power and control and knowledge and decision-making than resides within the woman herself over her own body. And I think if we can, whatever we do in the future in terms of making decisions about where and how women give birth, has to have women involved in that, those decisions. Any hospital or facility, and I'm focusing on hospitals because 98% of women give birth there, but any hospital or facility that is making a place, building a place for women to give birth, if they don't have a slew of women in, from the community involved in that design, those decisions, and even employment, they're, they're setting it up to call was harm. Wow, I think that's... Oh, you've made me cry. That's a fabulous place to end it, but jeez, I could listen to <laughs> you. Well, I could listen to you for hours. <laughs> I could. Thank you. Thank you so much. No, thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, I really appreciate it. And that's a wrap. You can check out the show notes to find websites, books, research articles, social media handles and general information about each of our podcast guests. Thank you to our fabulous Birth Time sisters, Zoe Naylor and Selena Scoble for supporting the creation of this podcast behind the scenes. If you're enjoying the show, please take a moment to follow or subscribe to Birth Time the Podcast. Leave us a review and a rating and please, we'd really love it if you'd share it amongst your friends and networks. You can also find us on Facebook and Instagram at Birthtime World and our website, birthtime.world, where you can also stream and watch our international award-winning film, Birthtime the Documentary. 
You can find out more about me, Jo Hunter, and my midwifery work at midwifejo.com.au and more about Jerusha Sutton and her gorgeous photography and doula work at jerusha.com.au. And thank you to you, our beautiful Birth Time family, for tuning in to Birth Time, the podcast. We really do appreciate you all so, so much. Until next time.